Father God, I thank you so much that you care about us, that you love us, not for anything that we do, not for anything that we accomplish, but because you are you, because you made us, because you have a plan for us, because you're a good God. Lord, I pray that you will just speak directly to every heart with your Holy Spirit bypassing me because your spirit is so much more articulate than I am. Thank you. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's start with a joke. One of my favorites. One time a while back ago, the Pope made a visit to the United States, which is a big deal, of course, and the media couldn't wait to get a glimpse of him. However, the Vatican didn't want him to be inundated by paparazzi, so they actually sent a number of jets, but only one jet had the Pope. Now, the Pope actually showed up in the middle of the night when no one expected him and the only one waiting for him there was a driver and a limousine. So the Pope crawled into the back of the limousine and the driver took off to the near ho nearby hotel. Now as the car moved, the window between the front and the back of the limousine opened. And the Pope said, ah, it's been so long since I've driven a car. It must be, it must be great to drive a car. Now, the driver was told not to converse with the passenger, so he didn't say a word. And the Pope said, ah, what I wouldn't give to have a chance to be behind the wheel again. Ah. What do you do when you're the driver and you're a devout Catholic and it's the Pope and the Pope says, please, what do you say? I drive the rest of the way to the hotel. Well, the driver looked around, pulled the car over, got out and the Pope got out and immediately sat down behind the wheel. And then the Pope said, hey, why don't you sit in the back of the limousine? Well, the driver had never had a chance to sit in the back, and so he did. But before he could even get seated, the Pope put the pedal to the metal and started racing down the street. He was dodging the cars up ahead until behind them there was a siren and flashing lights. So the Pope, the Pope pulled the car over. Now, the cop walked up and the Pope rolled down the window and, well, the cop shined a light into the car and he looked at the Pope, then he looked at the person in the back of the limousine and then he looked back at the Pope and he suddenly recognized the Pope. And he got very concerned and he said, wait here just a moment. He went back to his cop car and he got on the radio and he said, Chief, Chief, I think I've really done it this time. I think I have really, really stepped in it. And the chief said, Jones, what did you do this time? Did you pull someone over again that, that you shouldn't have? The cop said, yeah, I think I did. Oh no, said the chief. Did you pull over the mayor? The cop said, no, bigger than the mayor bigger than the mayor. Did you pull over the governor? The cop said, no, bigger, bigger than the governor. Bigger than the governor? Did you pull over the president of the United States? The cop said, oh, no, bigger, bigger than the president of the United States. The chief said, well, who's bigger than the president of the United States? I don't know, said the cop, but the Pope is driving him. I love this joke. It's, a, it's one of my favorites. And I think one of the reasons I love it is because in a funny way, it actually illustrates the most radical idea, I think, that Jesus ever put forward. It's still radical to this day that 
the kingdom of heaven is backwards. That's right. In the kingdom of heaven, the first will be last and the last will be first and the greatest will be the least and the least will be the greatest. Now, not to ruin a joke by trying to explain it, but admit it, the reason why the joke is funny, well, I think it's funny, is because the driver is a nobody. And the Pope, like every other celebrity, is a somebody. And so we find it funny. And herein lies the difference, I think, between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. You see, the kingdom of heaven is upside down. By every standard of this world, the kingdom of heaven is upside down, inside out, backwards, and mixed up. I mean, it rarely functions in the slick, focused, grouped way we think it should. Sometimes we're not even sure if it's functioning at all. And yet all the while, God is there working for the good of those who love him. Those we think of as the biggest, the baddest, the greatest in this world. According to Jesus, they're the least in heaven's kingdom. And... Throw in the recognizable, the famous, the beautiful, the successful, the rich, all according to Jesus, the least. And those whose autographs actually have some value, those who make us stare awkwardly in restaurants or make us cheer when they step onto a stage or a playing field, all the least. Now, notice he never said that they are nothing and they are not nobody, just that they are the least in the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus simply has a different set of values than the kingdom of the world. So who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, you might have, you might not have even noticed her when you drove to church today. Or you might not have noticed him when, you, when he picked up your garbage can or when he served you your coffee or maybe even greeted you at church. Be honest. It's easy to feel like a nobody in this world because truth is, you are. The world doesn't care about you or me. It may find us useful for 15 minutes, but then it will spit us out. The world is a harsh, prejudiced, and poor appraiser. The world measures your worth and my worth, our significance, by what we do, by what we've accomplished. What's more, accomplishment isn't enough if there isn't something to show for our accomplishments, trophies or plaques or media attention. And the fickle world is never impressed for long. See, you can accomplish great things. You can get all the hits you can imagine on your YouTube and score the hit song. But you know what? It's hard then to answer the last question, which is, what have you done for me lately? Now, for just a moment, step outside the cold attention of the world and into the upside down, inside out, backwards, mixed up kingdom of heaven. Right now, just step inside it. You might have to shut off your phone and you might actually have to look around and see that there are people around you. You, in this kingdom, are not a nobody. You are not a nobody in the eyes of the Father. The world may not know your name, but you know what? You know the name that is above every name. You have never ever, ever been worthless. We are all unworthy, 
but we have never ever been worth less. In the kingdom of heaven, you matter a lot. You have always mattered. You mattered even as your father's sperm fertilized your mother's egg. Even before your mother knew what to call you, before she missed her first cycle, God called you to a purpose. And as you literally sprouted limbs and grew eyes, as your tiny heart began to beat, God gave you a passion that burns up inside you right now. And you know what I'm talking about. I know you do. That hunger, not merely to make a difference, but to make a difference in a very you way. Yes. You see, Psalm 139, one of my favorites, says that he knitted us. He knitted us in the womb and he created our inmost being. Now, I can't believe that our inmost being refers merely to, I don't know, the pulmonary tract or maybe the large and small intestine or our nervous system. Uh, those are certainly the inner workings, but deeper than that lie our passions and our, our drive, our fervor, I love that word, and our bliss. God knitted all of that together, even as you and I breathed in amniotic fluid. He knitted into our very soul the reason why many of us are moved at the plight of children, at the plight of the disadvantaged or of the ill. The reason why some of us love to grow food or flowers. Why some of us love to grow schools. Why some of us love repairing houses and toilets or hearts. Now think hard on this. Think hard on this. You know it's true. He knitted into you the thing about you that makes you you. So you see, in contrast with the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of heaven, well, that's the one that Jesus says is here upon us. That's the one that Jesus said is around us, that for some of us, it's in us. That kingdom sees us differently. And in that kingdom, we are never worthless. But where does this worth come from? Unlike the world, unlike the kingdoms of this world, and of, of course, unlike the very bad religion that many of us have heard, our worth does not come from what we do or from what we accomplish, or what we have to show for our accomplishments. Have I mentioned, by the way, that the kingdom of heaven is upside down? You see, Jesus valued us before we'd ever accomplished anything. Before, I mean, before we were, before we, I mean, before we'd even given our hearts to Christ or considered doing so or even had the mind to do so. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Notice he didn't die. He didn't die to give us worth. No, he died because we are worth that much to him. And whatever small contribution that we may have to bring to the kingdom of heaven, solely by grace, through faith, can hardly be seen by ourselves, let alone by anyone else. It's upside down. It's inside out. No wonder, no wonder the Bible tells us that it's foolishness to the world. Now, the Bible is filled with mighty heroes that we often celebrate, like Gideon or Samson or Samuel or David or Daniel. 
mighty all of them and all of them by the way would make a great Hollywood film and some of them have and some of them have made terrible Hollywood films they they seem impressive to everybody's view whether of this world or of heaven but maybe that's why we focus on them because their greatness seems logical and then I read Hebrews 11 again, the Hall of Faith chapter of the Bible. First, we're given a litany of the mighty stars of the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. It's a great list for playing charades. All giants of the faith. But with each name, notice how they are acknowledged, not for what they accomplished, but for their faith that made it possible to accomplish mighty things. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses. Again, this is an upside down kingdom, isn't it? And these mighty giants of faith are acknowledged not for their accomplishments, but for their faith that made those accomplishments possible. Faith makes little sense to the kingdom of the world. You can't see faith. You can't cash in on it for a book deal. You can't use it to land on the cover of a magazine. So what's it good for? It may seem foolishness to the world, but by faith, you can be used by God to transform the world, usually in anonymity. Most of them have never gotten a book in the Bible named after them. Now back to Hebrews 11. Smack dab in the middle of this list of Uncle Arthur's blue Bible story greats, I read this. Maybe you've noticed it before. Beginning in verse 31, it says, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now, first of all, this is kind of interesting to me because this is actually the second time Rahab has shown up in the New Testament. And uh, why not? Because she is actually the great, 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 dot, 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 grandma of Jesus. So what if she's a prostitute, right? I mean, everyone has some skeletons in their family closet. Why not Jesus? Now, I've often wondered, what kind of brokenness would lead Rahab to be a prostitute? Was it a choice? Was it some bills she needed to pay? Was it forced on her? Did she maybe make a few mistakes which ruined her reputation? Who knows? But she did have faith. And her faith, which is a gift from God, not an accomplishment on her part, but a gift. That faith can do wonders in the upside down kingdom of heaven. You see, that mustard sized faith, that atom sized faith, is all God needs to take a broken woman and make of her a savior for an entire nation and make her the ancestor of David and the ancestor of Jesus. But, but notice this, in the next verse, starting with verse 32, it says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms and administered justice and gained what was promised. Now, this proves it to me. The kingdom of heaven is inside out and topsy-turvy. Because you mean to tell me that the writer of Hebrews doesn't have time to talk about Gideon or Samson or Samuel or David, King David? But he clearly has plenty of time to talk about the prostitute Rahab. 
because in the kingdom of heaven, everything seems backwards and screwy by the world's standards. But do you realize that if there had not been a Rahab, then there probably wouldn't have been a nation of Israel. And thus there wouldn't have been a Gideon. There wouldn't have been a Samson. There probably wouldn't have been a David. And one wonders about the line of Jesus. Rahab matters. A prostitute. A mere blip in the epic story of God's people. And one of the first in the kingdom of God. This encourages me, really. In the upside down and wonderful kingdom of heaven that Jesus spent the, the vast majority of his ministry proclaiming, we are worth so much. Not for what we've done. Not for any certificates on our walls or titles before our names. But for what God has done on our behalf. He created us. He knitted us together. He created our inmost being. He chose us for a purpose. And he is, even at this moment, at this very second, drawing us closer to him. And for those who allow him, he is even now working out all things even the bad things for good. Notice it doesn't say working out all things for our pleasure. No, all things for our good, which means the good of the kingdom of God. You know, I'm so grateful. I am really grateful for the leaders of this church. I, I, I can't express how grateful I am. And the blessing that they are to so many, including to me and my family. Every week, the leaders of this church pray a very specific prayer for me, for you, that every person here would be here at his calling and for his purpose. And the very fact that you are here at this moment, I believe means that he meant you to be here. For some purpose. Uh, maybe it's to encourage the person next to you whose name you're not sure of yet. Maybe it's to hear the words that I'm going to say right next. Here it is. God is actively involved in your life because you matter. You matter a lot. In a crowded room filled with people who don't even know you exist, he sees you and adores you because you matter. And even if you have not accepted Jesus, or even if you're not sure you want to, do not think for one moment that that makes you any less valuable to him. Hardly. He wants you in his house. Frankly, he's fixated on you. If you used to be one of his sheep, he desperately wants you back. And he's working hard to get you back. I used to hate the expression of saving the lost, reaching the lost. I hated that. It sounded condescending, doesn't it? A little bit. Everyone loves to be saved or to be found, but no one wants to be referred to as lost. I mean, it sounds demeaning. It makes one sound worthless, but I don't think that anymore. Think about this. Have you ever lost a Kleenex? Have you ever lost a paperclip or a toothpick? No, because those items do not have enough value to be lost. You might misplace them, but you just go get another one. However, what about if you lose a valuable heirloom? What about your dog or your cat if they get lost? Or what about a son or a daughter who's run away? They are lost and they are anything but worthless to you. 
<laughs> Are you kidding? You tear up the house to find the heirloom or you drive through the neighborhood yelling out your dog's name or your cat's name or you pray every morning, every day, every night for that son or that daughter. They are so valuable to you. You know, Jesus in Luke chapter 15 tells three wonderful stories you're familiar with. The story of a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. And I know you know these stories, but there's one thing I love about it. One is it shows that God is passionate to find us. And the other is when he finds us, because when the woman finds the coin, when the shepherd finds the sheep, and when the father gets his son back, in each of these stories, there's a party. God loves to party. So whatever your relationship is with Jesus, you matter. He wants you back, and he can't wait to party when you get back. That is the purpose of new creation to help people discover how much they matter. Not for what they've done or what they've accomplished or what they have to show for their accomplishments. No, we matter because of what he has done on our behalf. And we love to party. That's what we do every Sabbath. We come together and we worship him and we praise him. What are we doing? We're partying. We're celebrating that he has found us and he keeps on finding us. And more and more people get found and we celebrate further. That's what church is. We are a bullhorn in the hand of God telling people they matter. Because God desperately wants people to know that they matter in the kingdom. You matter a lot. I matter a lot. And I invite you, all of you, let's do this. As Paul says in Colossians, let's encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are all already doing. Because, and here is, I guess, the most controversial thing anyone can say today. It can get you fired. It can get you fired at. And even this last week, it can get you killed. God made you. He saves you. He wants you. He adores you. Because every life matters to God Father God thank you that we matter even though in the world's eyes we're nobody in your eyes oh we have such value because you made us because you have a plan for us you've known us longer than we've known ourselves Lord, I pray that we will have that assurance that we serve a God that knows us, that wants us, that loves us. And then may we be that bullhorn in your hand, telling the world that you desperately love them and they matter to you. May we be the kind of place where we celebrate and party with you because we were found. Because like the son who was once dead is now alive again. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, even us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.